Let's take a look at Airwick's new high-tech plug-in air freshener, noting that depending on where you are in the world, the plug, of course, will vary, but the body is more or less the same. It takes these standard Airwick wick bottles, and it's interesting to note that I tried the vintagest one I've got, a really old one. I don't even know how old this is. I did, did a bit of research on the internet and found that there were sellers in America selling these on eBay as original vintage sealed ones at quite a high price for an air freshener, but to the aficionados, that would probably be quite appealing. But it is backward compatible, whereas the original air freshener, they physically screwed in the bottles. These ones, it just pushes in, and it's got a couple of clips of this either side that holds it. This one is different from the normal units in that you've normally got a fixed heater, and when you rotate this knob, it either changes an air path to allow more air to flow through or bypass it, or it adjusts the heater height up and down to uh, determine how much fragrance is dispensed. This one is different. Whereas the traditional unit has a 2 watt heater, and you just vary it like that, this one has a 3.6 watt heater apparently, and it seems to cycle on and off. And it's notable that in the blurb for this they say, Airwick's unique anti-fading technology diffuses timed pulses of fragrance into your room to tackle olfactory fatigue. What they mean by that is that you get used to a smell, but because this is putting it out in bursts, uh, you're more likely to notice the smell. It continues on. Additional smart features include a distinctive satin chrome capacitive touch boost button. That's this here. You just touch it and it boosts. And what it does is it activates a 45 minute high intensity mode um, that then probably ramps up to the full power just for a period of time to give an extra boost of smell just before family arrives. It also claims it can indicate when the refill needs changed, presumably on a timed basis from the point it's first plugged in. Not sure. Or does it have a sensor? We'll find out. If it can actually sense liquid level, I doubt it. I'd think it would be time-based. Although, having said that, you look at the instruction of these and it says, lasts up to 90 days or something like that, but that assumes you're turning it off at night, which could disrupt that. But anyway, let me adjust the lighting and I'll show you it doing its little LED thing. So, one moment, please. So the first thing to note is there is a very dim warm white light behind the bottle to actually make it glow very gently at night time. When you touch the boost button, you can see that whatever setting you have it on, it's a little mask that goes around here, it ramps up and down. It's just cancelled the boost by doing that, I think. I think it ramps up and down to indicate the boost mode. If you do change it from setting to setting, it seems to recognise it because if you when you change the setting like this, it stays lit for a while, but then the LED goes out. But as soon as you change it to a different setting again, it lights again and then goes out, but then resumes that automatic cycling. OK, watch your eyes. The light is coming back. The light is back. So during my test with the plug-in power meter, the Hoppy, it uh, showed a typical ambient power of about 1 watt, but ramping up occasionally up to 4-ish watts. Um, so I guess that there'll be a base power for the circuitry that is hopefully going through the heater, because they often do that just as a, a means to get double duty out of the, the heating. But also, um, I'm guessing it's uh, just cycling the heating element on and off as, as mentioned in the olfactory stimulation thing. Right, these are notorious to open. They really seal them shut well because they don't really want them popping open accidentally. So this may be very difficult to open. I mean, I've opened them before and yes, they're very difficult to open. There's clips there, there. There's these super tight clips here. I'll try. I shall try. It's going to be destructive. It's going to be absolutely destructive. I think I may just use unreasonable force uh, because... Well, I got this so you don't have to take yours apart, so you know what's inside it. But this will be clipped together like dynamite because uh, they they don't want claims of people breaking them when they pull them out of the socket. Right, tell you what, I am going to pause because I know what's going to happen here and I don't want to stab my hand on full view. So I'll be back in a moment once I've opened this and we can explore the circuitry. One moment, please. Okay, we're in. The circuitry is coming out. The big reveal, the big reveal, a little touchpad here. The circuit board here 
with a switch on it. Oh, the switch is being operated. Hold on. The switch rides in... Can I get that out? Not really. Uh, the switch rides in a groove. So as you rotate that, it's clicking this... Oh, it's not just clicking up and down. It's just sliding that up and down. It's not going in decisive steps, which means the clicks are built onto this bit when, when the thing is assembled. Okay. I can see a couple of resistors. They are probably for powering the circuitry then. Uh, I also see... Oh, two wires going round to the front here, but one is only one is connected for this little touch sensor. I wonder if they had a other function they were going to include, or maybe one is for screening. That's very possible. And here is the heater, which is not coming off easily. Right, tell you what, it's, uh, it's clipped in as well. So let's pop that out. Okay, so it's potted in resin. I'm guessing just a couple of resistors in there, but we'll open it and find out. Uh, right, well, it's time to, time to take a picture of this and analyse the circuitry. There's the other LED. There's a mystery red LED that tells it when you indicates when you need to change the cartridge. Uh, Rightio, um, I shall take some pictures and we can explore this. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is complete. Let's explore. And the good news is that it's up to the usual standard of Airwick stuff, which is always quite well designed. Let's zoom down. So things worth mentioning. The circuit board also includes cable routing in it, like strain relief for the cables. That's quite nice. So this side of the circuit board has two resistors that are used as part of the power supply to limit the current, a smoothing capacitor, the terminations for the incoming supply, the output to the heater, the two wires going out to the touch sensor, and then it turns out this component here is not a slide switch. It's a potentiometer, a 10K potentiometer. If we take a look at the other side of the circuit board, we see a little microcontroller marked FMD. We have the incoming supply here with a couple of things going from that point. There's two 470K resistors in series going to the input to the microcontroller, suggesting that it's probably using it for timing or phase angle, con not phase angle control, but zero crossing point detection most likely. I think it's burst firing the heaters with this little transistor here, a 3D transistor. We saw that in a recent product. So here is the other part where it goes from live. It goes via these two diodes, two diodes in series, and then it feeds one end of the heater and it feeds one end of the resistive dropper. It goes through this resistor, goes back up, down through that resistor, and there's a capacitor and a Zener diode here. Uh, there's a the microcontroller. There's the potentiometer. I've drawn the sort of layout on it. I can actually show you a bit more of that because I removed the metal cover off the front. So if I was to zoom down on this, yes, it will be out of focus. And then I was to focus on it, you'd see there's the uh, solid track at the back that slides, and then there's the two ends of the carbon track at the bottom. So let's zoom back down to the lower level, and I'll actually even remember to focus back down this time. The other bits of the circuitry, there are a couple of resistors going out to the touch sensor, which does appear to have a screening wire. There's a little mystery capacitor here. Um, and there are two resistors, one for each of the white LED and the red LED, but there's another white LED and a red LED way up off the end. I cropped the circuit board down to make it more visible, but each of those has its own resistor too. It's kind of interesting to note, oh, I could finish colouring that in, in fact. It's interesting to note that both pairs of LEDs have a little zero-ohm link resistor leading over to them. That's about the only link there is on this uh, PCB, I think. Everything else is uh, well designed. Well, it's all well designed. Okay, let's take a look at the schematic. I should put that pen back up out the way. And we'll go over the worthy bits. Well, we'll go over the whole thing, which is worthy. There's incoming supply, live and neutral. Neutral is common throughout the whole circuit. Uh, in fact, the heater is switched down to the neutral by the 3D transistor, which is a 400 volt little low level transistor. The incoming supply goes via those two 470k resistors to the chip. So it can actually see that as a toggling logic state, um, which is capped by the internal protection diodes. 
these two diodes, the reason there's two of them is safety. It's just in case one diode fails, it's just an extra layer of protection. And after that, that goes and feeds the top of the heater. The um, resistor dropper is two 14K resistors. Brown, yellow, black, red. One, four, zero, and two zeros. Yep, 14K. And that goes down to the Zener diode, a 100 microfarad capacitor and a little decoupling capacitor that then feeds the microcontroller. That same roughly 5 volt supply, because it's a 5.1 volt Zener, goes to either end of that 10K potentiometer, which is used to detect the setting you've put it at. And then it goes via a 1K resistor to the capacitor here for basically filtering and then to the input of the chip. The four LEDs each has its own resistor, the 3K for the reds and 2.4K for the whites because they've got a slightly higher voltage. Um, there's that mystery capacitor, which could be a voltage reference, particularly given there's an analog to digital converter in here. But it could also be for the touch sensor. Now, the two touch sensor wires, one goes to the touch sensor pad, the boost button, via a 4K7 resistor. The other goes via 4K7 resistor and just basically runs along and just ends before the pad. It's almost like a little screening antenna. It may just be looking for some differential thing there. When it chooses to turn on this transistor, because the rest is ultimately done in the software, uh, it's got two pins driving the base of the transistor via an 18K resistor. That seems quite high value resistor and it's quite odd that they've got the two pins like that. Um, you wouldn't think they'd need really a high current given it can drive LEDs directly. Very strange. And that turns on the two resistors that are potted into this very hard, brittle plastic. I nibbled one side of it open after heating it up by using it itself without uh, any diodes, so it heated up a bit hotter. Then prized it open, and although I damaged the side of one of the resistors, I can see the colour codes are the green and brown are the first two stripes. And given the total value is about 10k, that suggests that these are 5.1k resistors. Two of them in series, potted into heat-proof resin in a heat-proof plastic, and switched by this little transistor. It's all very functional and straightforward. Quite neat. The secret sauce is ultimately, it's in the software, isn't it? how you process that. And I'm guessing, without knowing what that chip is, I'm guessing it probably doesn't have non-volatile memory. Could be wrong. Maybe it does. Um, how would it detect when you've changed the cartridge? I think it must just rely on being on all the time. Maybe that's what happens with these. People just plug them in, leave them on all the time. I don't. I occasionally get the urge to for a bit of aroma in the air, plug it in, and then when the aroma hits, I usually end up unplugging it. I've got a huge collection of the bottles for no good reason at all, all the different aromas. Buying into the marketing, I mean, the, this is a loss leader, this device. It, by selling the device, then they make the money on the little bottles of oil afterwards. I say oil. Some of them are based on oil miscible chemicals in a super refined sort of mineral oil base. Uh, others may be based on a glycol if they're water-soluble chemicals, aroma chemicals. There's a lot of science in aromas, a huge science in, in the synthesis of aromas. Um, but there we have it. Interesting, well-designed product, as most of these high-profile air fresheners are, and uh, quite interesting that they use the potentiometer specifically as the... Uh, level detector. I wonder how they did that. They're just looking for a change in the analog digital converter because as you rotate this, it basically just slides that little potentiometer up and down. Very clever. Very neat design indeed.